So our next um, speaker is uh, going to present us with a case study in public-private partnership in Limerick. Um, and Colette Cohen is the chief executive of the UL Hospitals Group uh, in the Midwest region. She has a, an organization that services uh, 400,000 people, uh, with staff of 3,500, uh, six sites across the Midwest. And um, she brings 28 years of experience to the health service. Uh, she was appointed in 2007 to the Director of Nursing in Nina, and then subsequently as Director of Nursing at Galway University Hospital, uh, and then became the first Group Director of Nursing and Midwifery in, uh, and at the Northwest Hospitals Group. Um, a CEO uh, of the UL Hospitals Group, uh, she, Colette reports to the HSE National Director of Acute Services, uh, with the group's planning and performance measured under the accountability flame framework for the HSE. She is also chair of the National Hospitals Group CEO Forum and sits on a number of other groups and task force. So I'd like you to welcome Colette Cohn to the stadium. Uh, to the Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now the clicker is gone, is it? Oh, it's here. Okay, I'm, I'm a great talker, but the first thing I have to say is, uh, blessed art thou among, me, among men. It's delighted. I'm delighted to have a woman on the podium and I thank Bill for including women uh, in the presentation, so thank you for that. Um, Bill asked me uh, about 12 months ago, I think, to talk about public-private partnership and the idea around it. Um, and I'm specifically looking at the Midwest region because we believe there may be uh, good news coming our way around the private health sector in the coming weeks or months. Um, so, uh, in the public sector, we're trying to be ahead of the posse to make sure that we're thinking outside of the box for our patients. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that might work. Um, this is me, of course. Um, my secretaries like to put pictures up, but I am a nursing background, so I have clinical experience. And I put another P into the pot, and that would be people. And the most important thing to me every day, all day, is people. That's my patients and my staff. And if, they're, if staff are happy, there's always good outcome for patients. So we embody that day in, day out. And from my point of view, I work for UL Hospitals Group. I'm 28 years um, in the Irish Public Health Service, and I know I look very young for that. But uh, I continue to work there, and I can't say there was every day I got up that I didn't want to go to work. So I think that's, that's good for the service. I'm going to talk a little bit about just uh, the Irish health sector, an overview of UL hospitals so people understand what hospital groups are about, the population profile in the Midwest because it will inform our discussion on public-private partnership, the challenges therein, uh, a bit of the private profile of the region and the opportunities for development. So we have been through a century of healthcare reorganisation. We've gone from the county councils to health boards to integrated service areas and back out again. Uh, to now what we are is uh, hospital groups. We have seven hospital groups in the country, six acute ones, and then the National Children's Hospital Group, which is uh, building away, uh, hopefully, in the next few years for a new centre. We also have nine community health organisations, so now they're led by nine chief officers that um, are informing the whole pace of community and social care, and we're trying to work with them. Um, we would prefer if it was seven and seven, but it's nine and six really, so uh, there's difficulty in that. What's unique to the Midwest is we're the only hospital group in the country that's co-terminus with a community health organization. So we've one chief officer, Bernard Gloucester, and myself as CEO, and we meet weekly and we work together with the community, with the Garda service, and with the city council and council to try and improve the life of our people and patients in the region. We have to remember the clinical care programs, they're aligned nationally about integrated care, chronic disease management and patient flow um, and we have to work along those lines to ensure that we do have good outcomes. And some of the speakers earlier spoke about the burden of illness and we have to keep that in our mind when we, when we are deciding the future. We have local accountability and we are empowered to, extent, to an extent to effect change and make change in the region. And we are under an accountability framework with the Department of Health and the National HSE, of course, who's our, of course, who's our employer. Um, we're driven by the national standards for better, safer health care. And we are in the throes of activity-based funding. And we think we can learn a lot from the private hospital system, private sector, who understand that whole model of business units. 
So the hospital groups were brought about by uh, Professor Higgins from Cork, another Cork man, um, and it came out in 2013 and defined the groups. And we are the Midwest area. This is what it looks like. So if you want to come work in the Midwest, work for me, work for the bond system, it's a nice region uh, to live in. Um, they are in mourning, of course, for Axel Foley in the last week or so. You can visibly feel it in the region around the Munster team. Uh, there are six hospitals uh, in, in UL Hospitals Group. We have a large complex Model 4 hospital in Limerick uh, that's providing a key service to the region. And we have Model 2 hospitals, we call them, which are smaller uh, units for lower complexity care. Uh, what's unique to our group, again, is we have only one emergency department in the whole of the Midwest. You probably read about us a good bit uh, in the local papers and the national papers. Um, so our footfall is quite high to our emergency department. Um, uh, this is the governance structure. I think it's important. I see it in your 2020 plan, Bill, around trying to develop governance and make sure hospitals work together in a system. So it's very important for me as a CEO that I'm assured that all the sites are safe because I can't be everywhere at once. I do report to the National Director of the HSE, uh, Lee Muds, uh, and upwards to the Director General and, of course, to the Minister for Health. And the way we worked out in Limerick, uh, UL Hospitals Group is to have uh, uh, an unusual governance structure in a, a vertical sense that we have no hospital managers or directors of nursing uh, running specific sites. We have directorate structures. So we have four directorates, medicine, periop, diagnostics and child and maternal health. And they're ran by a, a team of three people, the clinical director, the director of nursing and the general manager over their areas. So it's quite a unique system, but it's quite... Uh, a, a good performance uh, style system for me because I'm able to see exactly, I have three people to talk to at any one time to find out what's going across uh, the group, say in medicine or surgery. So that is the directorate structure. They are, of course, supported by quality risk patient safety, business managers and accountants to keep an eye on the money. A little bit about UL Hospitals Group. Um, every day um, we have 200 inpatient discharges. Um, we have 157 people come into the emergency department. That's grown in the last uh, month or so. We've just uh, hit on 200. Um, so that the activity has grown in the region all the time. 176 day case patients, and you can see nearly 900 outpatient attendances. And the great news, of course, is we have our maternity hospital as well, uh, over near Thoman Park, with 13 births a day, and it's important to have the babies coming up so they can look after us uh, when we get old. Activity is quite busy uh, through it. Um, that is the 2015 look at figures, and uh, even in the last week to look at the emergency department, we're going to hit on 63,000 attendances this year in the emergency department uh, in a hospital that has 400 beds. You can compare that to other major hospitals in the country who would have the same footfall but would have double the beds. So we have a capacity problem in the region uh, for access to beds. We're also unique that we don't have what we call a Model 3 hospital that would have an emergency department and a lower complexity of care but are able to provide uh, some assistance. So that, that is our uniqueness um, and also our, the thorn in our side, I would say. Uh, we spend about €720,000 a day just to run the group and our budget is £326 million and we have 3,800 staff working for us. Healthcare delivery, this is Bill's slide, that's why I put it up for him. He's always talked about research, academia and delivery. And for us, as hospitals, we work very closely with the University of Limerick in the region, but we can't do any of that without uh, industry uh, being at the table with us. And we're starting to work with industry in the region to see what can we develop. And there's some very good research projects underway um, with the university and ourselves and industry. So if you put all of those together, of course, you're going to have innovation, you're going to impact on patient care um, and make a difference for the future of the health service. And that's what I'm all about. I stand on podiums, I come to meetings, I meet people and we all talk about shoulda, woulda, coulda. Um, my children say it a lot to me. Um, we have to stop saying we should, we have to do. We have to have a strategy and a plan. And like the speaker said earlier, we can have the strategies, but if there's no action behind them, there's absolutely no point. And there's a lot of things we can do to improve uh, patient care across the country. As I said, University of Limerick is our academic partner. And currently on the site at uh, UL uh, Hospitals, we are building a clinical education and research centre that will open in December. It's a joint build with the University of Limerick um, that we hope will attract people over uh, from around the world to the region because we've Shannon Airport on our doorstep, of course, as well. Um, within the centre will be simulation rooms, a research floor for the university, um, an amphitheatre for lectures, and it's quite, going to be quite an impressive building uh, to drive the future of education and research in the region. 
Uh, we've just uh, built a new um, uh, dialysis unit opening in November, single room facility, uh, 24 bays. Uh, it's a growing um, uh, chronic disease in the region uh, and across the country. More and more patients are requiring dialysis treatment. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite interesting to see we're up by 50 patients this year and last year. The emergency department is a constant uh, upset for us and for our patients and equally for the public. Um, we have a new emergency department underway. I've committed to opening it at uh, the end of May. I could be um, held out to dry on that one, but we have to make sure uh, that we get the staff to come and work in the region and work in it. It's a uh, three and a half thousand square foot uh, and it's quite impressive even to see the work that's underway in it. Of course, um, as I said, someone said to me earlier, build it and they will come, and they certainly will come, and more and more people will come into the region. We're putting a 164-slice CT machine, it's the biggest one in the British Isles, into the emergency department, and in effect, that's going to attract more and more activity. Um, so that's just some of the slides on, on the bills around it. We also built a, a Lieben building. It was built by charity, a five-story building that opened in the last month. Uh, the J.P. McManus Trust, we have a very helpful gentleman down in the region, um, and it was built by CF as well and uh, Dermatology in Parkinson's Ireland. And it has CF floors, breast units, outpatient clinics, and it's a, a lovely facility, but it's an example that we don't always have to rely on capital development within the HSE um, to build uh, buildings, that we do invest, that the public sector doesn't have to fall down. We do need our National Children's Hospital and the money needs to go that way at this moment. But there's ways and means around everything else and I think we can collaborate on a lot of that in the future with the private sector. This is our critical care tower. Um, it's open two years, uh, cardiac and uh, ICU. And the, um, sorry, the ED will be underneath it. And within that, again, it's a quite an impressive structure where we could have synergies around the use of cath labs. We have a STEMI service coming in. Um, every day helicopters landing and there's work we can do around acuity. So our service strategy, our strategy is about to expire at the end of the year so we're looking closely at your 2020 plan to see what you're planning um, because we're about to embark on our next three year strategy that we will give to the Department of Health. We're trying to develop the small hospitals framework because we do have small hospitals in our region. We have a small hospital in Ennis, one in Nina, St. John's Hospital in the city, uh, and Croom Hospital, which is elective orthopaedic. We have to make sure they're sustainable. These are hospitals that will not close because it's not a political imperative and the community will be quite distraught, so we have to work on that. We're working on the clinical programs and the integrated care model. There's a new steering group which will be of interest to the private sector around how do we integrate care, how are we going to work together to look at the whole chronic disease problem that we have in the country. And you can see uh, our other um, strategy pieces there around diagnostics where we, again we can collaborate on because it's constant uh, pain for GPs that they can't get access to di diagnostics in the service. It's a changing environment and uh, we've always talked in hospital groups about moving to foundation trusts. People from the NHS might say, slow down and have a good think about that. Are we, re are we ready to be foundation trusts? No, we're not. Uh, we're only developing as business units, getting staff trained up in the idea of running like a, a private sector model. So we have a lot to learn from our colleagues. Um, we have clinicians in management. They're the most important people uh, to have in the room in any discussion. They lead and guide us in our decisions, and it would be very remiss of me um, to make decisions without them there in my ears. So we have them there as clinical directors and chief clinical directors. We are moving the directorates into business unit style thinking, activity-based funding, what's the outcomes for patients. So we're not worried about the money, we're worried about the outcomes. And again, we're moving into a whole era of licensing and innovation and research. Population just in the Midwest, it's growing as you can see. And uh, the last uh, check in 2016, it's just at 385,000 people. So it is a growth area. What's interesting uh, about the Midwest is there is, there's, there's older people that are living in the area. So you can see it's quite, pretty static on the kids' side of things. Uh, the youth are gone off to Dublin or wherever they're gone, I'm sure. Um, but you can see anyone from 45 on, they are actually, uh, there's bigger numbers in the Midwest area living. Uh, quite well. But what's interesting about it is they're living alone. So the 65 and overs, there's a large chunk here in Limerick City, in the green area, that live alone and require a lot of help from us and home care assistance. And a lot of the time, they would tell you when you meet the patients and talk to them, especially people over 65, that they are terrified of going into hospital. They are terrified of ending up on a trolley in my emergency department. And they're terrified that they will never come back out. 
and they, they have said to me, you're young, you don't have the fear of not coming back out. So they need a lot of support uh, while they're living alone to be looked after in the home and there's initiatives around outreach care and how we can help them from our point of view. Um, some of the facts is from population health is that people over 65, will, it'll grow by 3.2% from 2016 to 2017 alone. Aged 85 and over is going to grow by 3.7%. We've crunched the numbers nationally and we know it's going to cost us 90 million euro just to deal with that growth. And that's just for their health care. Um, the chronic disease management side of things is preventative. That's where we should be, but we're in the curative stage. We are bringing more and more people into hospital, surviving them from acute illness. We have to get out and look at the whole preventative model, and work is underway under health and wellbeing on that. We have a lot of work to do in the community on that. Um, it's very slow, in my view, the enhancement of the community services. I know that funding has been diverted that way to help patients. I think we have to do an awful lot more with our GPs, and that was mentioned earlier. And there's a job of work that we can do again with the private sector and the third sector around ambulatory care models uh, out in the community working with the people because in effect the acute hospital should be the last place you should start out in. Um, so you can see the challenges are the ageing demographics not only in the, in the country but equally in the Midwest. The resources, there's a big market uh, shortage in, in the region. You cannot get theatre nurses if you look at it. Uh, so if you want to come and open a load of theatres, and you have to think about how are you going to actually plug the market. And my colleague from um, Sailtha told me that the NHS have just stopped funding uh, nurses' education and pulling back some of the money, which might see some of the Irish uh, staff coming back to work uh, in the country, but we need to look at that. Access to appropriate consultant expertise. A lot of them have gone abroad. Um, I would wonder about their contract and the money they get paid for the work that they do. Um, it's to get them back into the country. So the Clinical Education Research Centre um, offer them opportunities to work and do their research and try and attract them back from uh, the States, uh, etc. Um, the access to high acuity care, that would be a challenge for the private sector. Um, because you have to make sure that while you do work in the, in the, on waiting lists and that, that they can access intensive care, critical care, if something does go wrong. Um, and I think that's where it could naturally occur with the new critical care block uh, in the region. Retrieval policies needs to be considered. It's a big challenge. Um, and around that, it's about um, making sure that patients, if they deteriorate in a service, that you can move them quickly along for their care and treatment. And that needs an enhanced transport service. And we've heard from Bumbalance around that and children. So there is more work required in that area that we think we can groundbreak on um, with our colleagues in the private sector. Of course, all of that requires leadership and innovation. So if you have good people working with you, um, you have to ensure that you're developing them now to deal with the next 10 years, really, for the region. So we've talked about the demographics, the deprivation levels. We could talk about um, older people, etc. in the region. We also have to look at the younger, young teenage pregnancies. Um, the Limerick City would, have been, would be one of the most socially deprived regions uh, in the country that needs a lot of uh, assistance and care, and we do a lot of work with them. And again, mortality ratios. And in the Midwest, our, our biggest ratio for uh, death is actually cardiac disease, and the second to that is malignancies, because most people think it's around cancer. So we have to look at the geographical factors around that. Um, so you can see there very clearly in the slide the Midwest from socially... Uh, uh, economic groups, the disadvantaged are very disadvantaged that we do have um, work to do in that area. The SIREN study just in Trinity College was done recently around access uh, for uh, urgent care, if you're thinking of urgent care centres, the local injury units and emergency care, uh, it actually showed that we had, there was poorer access for people of the west and the south to urgent care, so there's a real opportunity there to develop more of uh, the drop-in centres and ambulatory care around it. Um, just a little bit about the private profile. There's 400,000 people approximately in the Midwest, and 180,000 of them are privately insured. Two thirds of them stay in the catchment area, but we're losing one third um, outside of it. So um, we have to work on getting uh, people back into the region to trust us. So the opportunity for us is to make sure um, that we, we can transform our health system 
to have a new model of care, higher quality care and equal care in the system. To have a new model of care, we have to improve patient access. And I have to say today, it is not all about waiting lists. There is an awful lot more work and that we really would like to do it. Uh, we need to stabilise the health market and it is stabilising. It's a progressive uh, growth sector in the Midwest. There's a lot of capital development. Universities doing a lot of work with us. So we need to attract people to come back and work in the region. It's actually cheaper to buy a house there as well. And we need to work together on collaborative, creative contracts for recruiting people so they can wor work in both sectors. That involves looking at contracts for consultants so that they can get access to both sites and share it. So we have advanced nurse practitioners that could work across sites, work in the community and help you with educational accreditation as well. So the high quality care is to get the clinical expertise in. We can share the regulatory experience and what we've been through, the health inequalities, but the main thing is to reduce the burden on society. So we can actually collaborate quite well on that. I'm rushing now because I'm watching my time. The equal care then, of course, is to think outside of the box. So again, I would say we need to talk about waiting lists at the beginning of the year, not at the end when the pressure comes on. We actually do need to talk about the ambulatory centres. What can we give patients access to? around chronic disease management, preventative medicine, and work with the youth of the area. So we have a social responsibility on it. We have to look at pop-up clinics and outreach to community mental health and the third sector. And that is, can be all underpinned by service level agreements. We do have the ability to take the pressure out of the health service. Driving up the road today, I had 41 patients on trolleys in the, emer in the emergency department, the highest ever I've had uh, in my two years there and the concern and worry about that and how can we work together to make sure that not every patient in the region has to walk into the emergency department to get care that we can offer more to them. So there's a lot of public private working we can do and we can do that in tandem rather than in competition. So in conclusion, there is an opportunity here. I think working with uh, Bill, we know that he's an action paced person um, and that we can do a lot. So I would say our brand, if you look at our brand, it's working together, caring for you. We do put patients first. We're open to innovation in the region. So we will drive the agenda for public uh, patient confidence in the Midwest. And we'll do it any which way we can to make sure that patients get the access to care and that they have freedom of choice for their treatment. So I'm looking forward to partnering for the future of health. That was very fast. Um, <laughs> thank you.